The White Vault will return in October. Please stick around after the credits for additional information. The following documents and recordings are the 20th installment in a compilation detailing the events of the repair team sent to Outpost Freestead, consisting of Dr. Rosa Della Torre, Walter Heath, Graham Kasner, Dr. Karina Schumacher Weiss, and Jonas Thorison. In the winter months, Gauss storms in Svalbard can reach wind speeds of 130 km per hour. Accompanied by or following snowfall, such storms can reduce visibility dramatically, more so in the winter months of the polar night. During these storms, travel is not advised. The White Vault. Installment, Jonas Thorison is left alone within the caves, still searching for a way home. This first recording is from the phone of Dr. Rosa Della Torre. Rosa, Rosa, I, I, can you hear me? Are you there? Rosa, there was a bright light. I can't see. I can't see you. I have your phone. You're back. It's me, Rosa. It's the real Jonas. Please don't leave me alone down here. No harm in. Feel good, my Rosa. Walter, Kastner, Karina. It's my fault. Write a note, leave it in the cave for her. If she comes back, some glow sticks. And I'm getting the fuck out of here. earlier. I'm too big to fit the lower pass. No. No, I can get through. First up, Gunnar. Happy birthday. Uh, can't freeze out there if I never make it out of here. Oh! The recording continued for approximately 20 minutes and included the pained sounds of Mr. Thorison crawling through a small cave pass. It then ends without note and the phone, like the others, was found without power. The following was written on the last pages of Mr. Graham Kasner's notepad by Mr. Thorison. The handwriting does not precisely match the previous pieces by him, but it is signed and written in Icelandic. The handwriting is more aggressive and wild as though written by an uncontrollable and shaking hand. 
blood stains the pages. Til hvað sem finnur þetta? Nú leið aldrei að mér. Og það er bara aldrei allan sannleikan. Það mér ekki drepa mig og skilja hjarta mitt eftir að ykkur anskota sporði. Það var aldrei áallinun. To whoever finds this. She didn't lie to me. She just didn't tell me the truth. It will not kill me and leave my heart on the table. That was never its intentions. Not with me. Something happened to Rosa in the white-lit cave somewhere beneath me. I'm a coward and I did not wait to find her. I retreated through the small passage we have come through and found the lower pass we had chosen not to take. I had to struggle to fit the pass. I discarded my winter coat and I heard the putrid skin tear from my hand. Now, without a jacket and a way back, I am stuck here. I crawled for so long in the dark. I'm unsure of how much time has passed. At times I could have crawled with my eyes closed, it would have made no difference. Like a worm, skin slithers off, sloughs off. We were so close, Rosa and I. We took the wrong path and it killed her. I killed her. I couldn't fit, I said. I could. I did. I crawled and I crawled. And in the dark behind me I heard laughing. Maybe the thing. Maybe Karina. My memory is fading fast. And I saw it. A snake. The rope. Rope from our original descent down these fucking caves. Lying there, discarded. I was there. In the caves, like they thought. To the bunker. But I will not go free. With every pull through those cramped tunnels and caves, I could feel the skin slipping from my body. My fingers, my hand, arm, shoulder, chest, back. My legs now, already. Sitting here, I took a look. There is far less blood than I would have thought. When you see it, it sees you too. When you hear it, it hears you too. When you feel it, it touches you. When it calls you, it has you. When you feed it, it claims you. My fingers aren't my own. On the other hand, long, black, leathery things it shines like an orc, swimming. Up my hand, up my arm. I don't want to look anymore. That's my skin on the ground beside me. I took off my hat. My hair's coming out. Brought the bags. Mine and Rosa's. Though it does me little good. I put a crate on top of the hatch. Found a thermal blanket. The storm's too hard. I can't even see the buck. So here I will wait. Happy birthday. Love, Jonas. This was the last piece of written or recorded evidence my team was able to collect from the repair team sent to Outpost Freestead. Originally consisting of Dr. Karina Schumacher Weiss, Walter Heath, Graham Kasner, Dr. Rosa Della Torre, and Jonas Thorison. No trace of any member of the team has been found. Their respective friends, family, or workplaces reported them missing. Several official investigations began, and based on the details in these documents, it is my personal opinion that they are dead. The letters intended for loved ones were sent to their respective destinations and the recording is given to the appropriate law enforcement agencies. Very few of the official investigations believe the writings and recordings to be authentic. As a whole, they are considered a sick joke and have not been presented to their families. The winter expedition to Outpost Freestead took place in 2010. The disappearances never made public headlines. Seizure Group made attempts to send rescue missions, 
but storms in the area made accessing Svalbard's interior difficult. The only active rescue group on Svalbard was soon dispatched. They were never heard from again, and unlike the repair team, no records or traces of them were ever found. In March of 2010, the eruptions of Eyjafjallajökull restricted air travel across Europe. Although Svalbard was not overly affected by the ashfall, travel to and from the island became costly. Seizure Group attempted to fund another rescue mission, but it turned into a public relations nightmare for Holder Runas Dottir, CEO of Seizure Group and grieving widow of Jonas Thorison. The press believed she was sending rescue teams on an impossible mission, losing more lives in the selfish hopes of finding her husband. Seizure Group then retracted their final attempt and Holder took several months of reprieve from her duties as CEO. No further official treks would be made to Outpost Freestead. I began this arduous investigation following a peculiar event. In April of 2010, I received an anonymous package. Its contents included a small bone carving, a set of coordinates and a letter. The bone carving was wrapped in soft protective packaging. It was a figurine following the soft curve of bone, depicting an animal or mythological creature I cannot identify. I have sent the carving off to a university with some grant money in hopes of further investigation. I am still waiting on results for the suspected provenance, age and cultural association of the carving. The coordinates present in the package were those of Outpost Freestead, which sparked the initial investigation. The letter's envelope was of particular interest, new, crisp and white. But first, the envelope's contents. The letter inside was worn and old, perhaps a hundred years or more. It was written in a sprawling cursive. Here is the translation from the Danish. Jeg ved ikke, hvem jeg skriver til, men jeg ved, at det må skrives. Der ligger under de tilisede sten på det helvede sted. En dæmon eller heks, der stjal min elskede mands liv. I do not know to whom I write, but I know that it must be written. The lies beneath the icy rocks of that far hell, a demon or witch who has stolen away the life of my beloved husband and in so doing consumed the joy of my son's soul. I am not speaking of the great white bears of the Arctic Circle, who in their demeanor and manner are just beasts of the wilds. What I speak of is black, both like the smoke that burns our lungs and the dark of the great sea that takes so many mother's sons. My son is set to depart and his fishing vessel is destined to take him there to those shores. My husband, a man blessed with God's bravery, could not save those men, and now I cannot save our son. It is often folly for women to speak of wickedness, but I am strong of heart and mind. I speak of it as it must be known not to coward from it. When you see it, it sees you too. The letter's envelope was new and clean. It was certainly not the original casing for the note and gave me no information on its author. It was addressed directly to me in typed font along with handwritten words, Sister dead, come home. To my knowledge at this time, I did not have a sister. After this note, I took it upon myself to locate a copy of my birth certificate. Although I will keep much of my personal data redacted, I located the full birth name of my mother. She is a prominent businesswoman from Sweden with whom my father had an affair. Search results of the information regarding her recent life events included a condolence article written in regards to the passing of her daughter, my half-sister. Still unsure of the importance of this new personal information, I moved forward with the examination of the coordinates and outpost Freestead. After extensive research and private funding, my team arrived at outpost Freestead on May 1st. 
Their investigatory exploration lasted three days, yet they were unable to locate the documented town beneath the glacier. The hatch in the auxiliary bunker descended to a cave, but every passage examined reached a dead end. Here are several short excerpts from the report on their findings from Outpost Freestead. Outpost Freestead was in a state of disarray when we arrived. Clearly, no one had been here to search for the missing team, or to clean the station since the repair team disappeared. The bedding from every bunk was piled and strewn across the floor of the primary and commissary areas. Spoiled and rotten food had soaked through cardboard boxes, causing the whole bunker to reek until we had aired out interior for several hours. The door was unlocked when we arrived. We had some difficulty entering the auxiliary bunker, requiring the use of a crowbar to pry open the door. The door was a heavy film of dark red rust that helped seal it shut and kept in the smell. The odor within is most aptly described as rotting meat. Inside were the standard shelves and storage crates, but also a pile of discarded clothes and thermal blankets pressed into a corner, similarly to an animal's nest. It was littered with sections of thin, rotted, degrading meat. We also found two packs, within which we found many of the writings and recording devices we sent back to you. This included phones, notes, notepads, letters, recorders, a damaged laptop, and the broken video camera. To the north, we spotted something perhaps 50 meters from the bunker. Upon closer and cautious examination, we found the splayed, mutilated corpse of a mature adult reindeer. Mr. Perot was unable to identify what had killed the animal, but was able to conclude it was not due to a polar bear. It was rotting away, meat and all. Nothing had come to scavenge from it. My team has now safely returned from their short expedition. Then, on June 22nd, I received a phone message from the talented epigrapher Dr. Noble, to whom I had sent a copy of the script rubbings taken by Dr. Della Torre. This is that voicemail. Good day. This is Dr. Noble from the University of Toronto. We've emailed recently regarding the interesting copies of script rubbings you sent me. At first, given you did not want to share their origin, I was apprehensive in considering their validity, and I apologize for this. I am thankful you are now sharing the information, though now I have a different reason for my reservations. You must understand my... that there is no record of human occupation on Svalbard before the modern age, not even archaeological evidence supporting Viking occupation. Regardless, I am still unable to give you any information regarding the script, but I recently received some correspondence from my colleague at a partnering university. She is the historical linguist I passed the script on to for further insight. She is enthralled by the script, similarly to my interest, and is baffled by your information. She contacted me in reference to a new find, a script with striking similarities, even several exact character matches, has been located on a current excavation. I need to tell you where. Call me. Before returning the call, I received an international collect call from Nialasund. The following is part of the digital recording. woman who funded the main investigation team to outpost Freestead? Yes, though my team has left Svalbard. I heard there was a reward for information on the first lost team, a team where rich Icelandic woman's husband never returned. If the information is good, I am perfectly willing to part with a reward. You could be lying. Money first. Is your information worth that much? Is it that important? Yes, it's worth it. Send the money. You believe you are the only one in the Isle of Sand with this information? Something so important? I hear others in the room. They know too, most likely. Tell me now. I will send you the money. Do not tell me. Someone else surely will. In that case, you, 
receive nothing. British bitch. Reward just dropped. Fuck it. The information. We found one of them. This concludes the last documents and recordings related to the repair team sent to Outpost Freestead. This completes the 20th collection of information regarding the investigation of the events at Outpost Freestead and the mystery of what hides beneath the ice. The White Vault will return in October. Until then, you can find more content from The White Vault on our Patreon, or listen to our other shows, such as Liberty Tales from the Tower, returning this March. The Freestead Expedition, written and created by K.A. Stats, produced and edited by Travis Vengroff, starring the voices of David Alt, Peter Lewis, Lonnie Manella, Ethor Fithjorsen, Kessie Rilinicki, and Hem Cleveland, with supporting voices by Essa Anderson, Charlotte Norup, Mark Verdlib, Gemma Lorel, and special guest David Cummings of the No Sleep Podcast. Our cover art was created by Kessie Rilinicki, and the White Vault theme, Unsealed, was composed by Brandon Boone. The White Vault is mixed and mastered by Brandon Strader and Sarah Baczynski. The White Vault is a Fool and Scholar production, copyright 2019. The White Vault is a trademark of K.A. Stats. The show's translation team consists of Guillermo Tenorino, Rika Gorn, Ethor Vithyarsson, Essa Anderson, Charlotte Norup, Kessie Rilinicki, Natalia Sebrayansky, and Ekaterina Ptashkina, with assistance by Sergei Sebrayansky. The White Vault is made possible by our Fool and Scholar Patreon members. Special thanks to patrons Zach Israel, Matthew Staten, Marcus Larson, Fallon Gannon, Jeffrey Ali, Adam Farber, Jennifer Lowry, Scott Morrison, Christian Treat, Maria Berglund, Daniel Urchwal, James Reese, Daniel Stewart, Monica David, Sasha Friedrich, Miko Atsuna, Libet Reed, Kayla Blue, Boonhead, Chris Enrico, Monica Paredes, James MacArthur, Jordan M. Ellingson, and Jonathan Wade. You help make our stories possible. If you want more content from the White Vault, join our Patreon for the upcoming spin-off miniseries, Imperial, set in 18th century China. You'll also get access to Artifact, our original miniseries regarding the strange bone carving received by the documentarian. Thank you for listening and supporting independent productions. We hope you'll join us on our next adventure. <laughs>